The new map in 1760 was in English. That was the year the Marquis de Vaudreuil surrendered Montreal to General Geoffrey Amherst. New France was to become a British colony. And from now on, in these streets, English would be heard as well as French. Montreal's location was ideal for trade with Europe. But for large ships, the Lachine Rapids blocked the St. Lawrence River and the route to inland North America. And so, in the 1820s, a canal was built to bypass these rapids. This Lachine Canal was a heroic achievement, according to historian Sam Allison. The construction of this canal was the most ambitious and most expensive project in Canada up to that time. Built by pick and shovel, it was nonetheless a great engineering feat. James Richardson, who promoted the project, was a Scot. Burnett, the chief engineer, was English. David David, who promoted the project politically, was Jewish. The canal workers came from the British Isles. So the canal builders reflected the English-speaking Montreal of that time. Besides transportation, the new canal provided water power to run the mills and factories that sprang up on its banks. Canada's first boot and shoe factory, its first paint factory, foundries, cotton mills, shipyards. The axes used by lumbermen in the Ottawa Valley were made here, and sized for the farms of Ontario. Montreal had become the cradle of Canadian industry. The new industries needed skilled craftsmen and laborers, and most of them came across from England, Scotland, and Ireland. It was these immigrants who built the Victoria Bridge across the St. Lawrence River, a structure that would be hailed as the eighth wonder of the world. Montreal was destined to become the world's largest inland seaport. And in its time, one local company, the Allen Line, would own no fewer than 137 ships. Europe, Asia, Africa. While ships of the Allen Line sailed eastward, another enterprise of Montreal Anglos, the Canadian Pacific Railway was pushing its tracks to the west, toward the Pacific Ocean. Soon the commerce of Montreal would circle the globe. Meanwhile, the city's prosperity attracted large numbers of French Canadians who came in from the farms to work in the factories. And by 1870, the Anglos were no longer in the majority. At the St. Andrew's Ball, the ancestors of most of these merrymakers came from the British Isles. Their dyed-in-the-wool Anglos, Anglophone pur laine. But what about Antoinette and Louis Caruso, just married? Where do they stand in the linguistic scheme of things? Their families came from Italy. And so, in the unique terminology of Quebec officialdom, they're neither Anglophones nor Francophones, but allophones. For most Montrealers of Italian descent, English is the Canadian language of choice. Thus, despite the allophone label, you could say that these Italians, especially the younger ones, are actually Anglophones, part of English Montreal. Best wishes on your wedding day and a life long and happy in love from the gang. Dagli amici, compari, Patrizia e Jack Moulet. In Montreal, there are almost 200,000 people of Italian descent, the largest of the city's many ethnic groups. If Quebec is different from Canada, Montreal is different from Quebec. The rest of the province is virtually all French. But in Montreal, there are more English-speaking people than the entire population of New Brunswick. The allophones, the immigrants, 
The law makes them send their children to French schools. But English is always a great temptation. And the future of the city's linguistic makeup depends largely on choices made by these many ethnic groups. It's a French city that the nationalists want. And when immigrants keep gravitating toward English, it's a matter of concern for people like Gilles Prou, host of a popular talk show on French radio. Well, it's a shame for us uh, to find out that some people are arriving here, and after three weeks, three months, or three years, they say, uh, we're in America here, we're not in Quebec, speak English. It's an insult. Immigrants, they say, should show respect for the language and culture of the majority. But that phrase, show respect, makes many newcomers uneasy. It reminds them of oppressive regimes in other countries, and many of them, after a sojourn in Montreal, decide to move on, to join the exodus. Some are headed towards the States, some have already left and have headed to Vancouver. Uh, some are thinking of moving to Greece just like me, because I'm Greek, so... Some are planning to stay here, but most of my friends are planning to leave. Hockey, in English Montreal. That's where the game was invented, with rules that were drawn up in 1878 by three students at McGill. Football, McGill versus Harvard in 1874. The first ever international football game. Lacrosse, our national sport in the 1870s, with great teams fielded by the Montreal Amateur Athletic Association. And there were intrepid cyclists, too, who wore the colors of the MAAA. And in 1890, Louis Rubinstein brought glory to the city by going to St. Petersburg and winning the World Figure Skating Championship. There was culture, too, in English Montreal. And there was an eager welcome for visitors like Charles Dickens, Mark Twain, and Oscar Wilde. In more recent times, in the creation of literature in English, Montreal has been far ahead of the rest of Canada. Little magazines published here were the first to give voice to poetry in the modern vein. The first group was uh, consisted of A.J.M. Smith and Frank Scott and A.M. Klein, Leo Kennedy. They started around uh, 1925 or so. It's called the Poet's Corner in Ben's Delicatessen downtown. Generations of Montreal poets have eaten here. Among them, Louis Dudek, poet and professor of English. Colonial cultures are conservative. Canadian culture in Victoria, Winnipeg, in Toronto were slow to change and would not easily take on the modernism of a e. e. Cummings or an Ezra Pound or a T.S. Eliot. F.R. Scott was certainly open to change. He was in at the very beginning of the modern movement. Then there was Irving Layton, who emerged in the 1940s, and Leonard Cohen, writers who took risks in a Canada that was cautious and correct. As I've said sometimes, it seems to be uh, the destiny of Montreal to, to show the rest of the country from time to time what poetry is. Hugh McLennan, novelist. In fiction as well as poetry, Montreal has nurtured a disproportionate number of Canada's best writers, like Mordecai Richler, Mavis Gallant, and Brian Moore, who wrote his first books while living in this city. And, of course, the man who was the most widely read Canadian author of all time, Stephen Leacock. Also in Montreal, Ernest Rutherford, pioneer atomic physicist and winner of the Nobel Prize. Carrie Derrick, the first woman in Canada to become a full professor. Dr. Wilder Penfield, Dr. Maud Abbott, Dr. William Osler, world-famous medical pioneers, all associated with McGill University. The nightlife of bygone Montreal, another Anglo domain, with music by Ina Ray Hutton and her melodiers.
and Oscar Peterson at the Alberta Lounge. Johnny Holmes at Victoria Hall, the Saturday Night Dance. The Club Saint Michel was the place to go back in the 1940s and 50s. And Rockhead's Paradise, the El Morocco, the Bellevue Casino, the Copacabana, the Latin Quarter, a city of nightclubs, a show business city. Miss Noelle Toy, the Chinese stripper. And Rosita Royce, who danced with her doves. Wicked, wicked Montreal. They called it the Paris of North America, and American tourists came in droves. But oddly enough, this particular Paris was an Anglophone invention. The entrepreneurs who created it were almost all Anglos. When I took over the property, uh, this belonged to the fish market next door. And uh, this whole area here was covered with a roof. And there was 10 inches of concrete on the ground. It was in 1961 that Eric McLean acquired the neglected Papineau House in Old Montreal and started restoring it, the beginning of an Anglo enterprise that would help preserve French history. This area is the thing that gives Montreal its richness and depth. Otherwise, it would be just like any other large industrial town across North America. This, after all, is where the very first uh, French colonists landed off there. But by the 1950s, Old Montreal was a crumbling industrial wasteland. Historic buildings were being torn down to create parking lots until Eric McLean moved into the old Papineau house. I was soon followed uh, within a couple of years by Fred Lebensold, and he bought the fish market next door and fixed that up into condos. And then uh, Aird Nesbitt bought the Calvay house down at the corner. And then uh, B.J. Brainerd, a woman, bought one over on uh, Place Jacques Cartier, and from there on it was just expanding and expanding and expanding. And so, with Anglophones leading the way, old Montreal, with its rich French heritage, came to be preserved. <laughs> 